out in the foyer, you're welcome to come inside and to join us. Oh dear. I think we have more than half the church out in the foyer. Um, Camilla, why don't you open those doors as well and there's other doors and welcome people in. Welcome, please come in if you're planning to attend 10.30 church. We are kicking off. And we'd love to have you inside. Welcome, if you're visiting, Arity. And I'm not sure if Noah's visiting or if Noah's new, but anyway, great to have you with us, Noah. And I think uh, we are all here. Well, a very happy Mother's Day uh, to those who are mothers. Maybe you've had some morning celebrations, some pancakes and coffee in bed, or maybe not. Or maybe that's coming later in the day, a phone call maybe, some connection. Um, and hopefully you're remembering your mother. My mother always gets a very late phone call on a Sunday. But it is a day that we remember our mothers. And uh, it's a day we're thankful to God for our mothers. And it's a day that we also remember the life-giving nature of God himself. Um, because, of course, when we remember our mothers, the fact that they've birthed us and raised us and provided for us, we're also remembering that our God has given us our life and breath. And so I wanted to read from Acts chapter 17, where Paul is in the Areopagus of Athens and he's mixing it with the philosophers and the thinkers and uh, the religious, uh, um, uh, religious people. And he says to them, he describes to them the God who has made the world. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord. Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by hands and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them the exact places where they should live God did this so that people would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him though he's not far from each one. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So Mother's Day, it's a day that we remember that we are the offspring of a particular woman and man, but we're also remembering that we are the offspring of God. He's given us our very life and breath. And so we're going to sing by praising our God in heaven. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Let's sing it with joy.
Do take a seat, sorry. Um, he is the King of Heaven. He is our Creator. And uh, it's interesting that when the Apostle Paul is in the middle of Athens about the God who's given them life and breath, he then moves on to tell them and remind them that he's a God who will bring his justice and his judgment. This is how he continues. He says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine beings like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill, now in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Um, it would be true to say that when our mothers gave us life, um, they didn't just allow us to live however we might like. They tried to teach us right and wrong. They tried to teach us justice. And at times they'd bring punishment. And Paul's saying that the God who's given us life and breath will hold us accountable too for that life that we've lived. And so we shouldn't live in ignorance to think that God is an inanimate object and that uh, we can live however we want, but rather he has set a day when he'll judge the world with justice. And when we get into 2 Samuel 4 later in our service, um, not the sort of passage you might have thought I would have chosen for Mother's Day because I didn't choose it for Mother's Day. It is about God's justice. But let's pray because he is a God of justice. Let's pray. Oh Lord God Almighty, we praise you because you are the one and only true and living God. You've given us life and breath. Our life is yours and you've given it to us to live. Lord God, you've created all things by the power of your word and you continue to rule and guide all things in your infinite wisdom. Uh, your ways are far above ours, your paths beyond tracing out. And so we do praise you for your greatness, and we also acknowledge our own frailty and our sinfulness. Lord, we know that all have sinned and fall short of your glory. And so even though you've given us life and breath, and even though you are a loving and good God, we too easily forget you in our daily living. Lord, we confess we disobey your word uh, especially your commands to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, we are sorry for walking in our selfish, self-centred ways. We've sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We've brought judgment upon ourselves. But you, Lord God, are loving and merciful. And so we thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve. Thank you that as well as being our judge, you are our saviour and that you've given your son our Lord Jesus, uh, that he would take the, our punishment upon himself at the cross, that we'd be forgiven and set free from the wages of sin, that we'd be washed clean, and that you would take up residence in us by your spirit. you give us new life, and that we'd be adopted as your children, welcomed into your family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the assurance of an inheritance that we could never have earned, but is given to us because we have been found in the Lord Jesus. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to walk in the newness of our life, um, help us to turn from ungodliness, sin, and to overcome temptation. We pray that you would help us to exercise self-control over our tongues, our thoughts, our desires, uh, so that we might bring forth fruit that is acceptable to you, that we might live out the family likeness, um, we pray. And Heavenly Father, we ask that as we uh, spend time together today uh, reflecting on your kindness to us, um, often poured out on us uh, through our mothers who provided for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray too that you might encourage us as people who can shape the lives of others in a motherly kind of way. Uh, Father, we pray uh, that you be with us as we meet as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Well, God has appointed the day to judge all things, um, and he's done that in his Son, who's also our Saviour. So uh, let's sing You Alone Can Rescue. So 
take a seat. If the children can come up the weeks ago with lots of attachments. However, um, there is the summary attachments just on the table out there. So um, if you just want to pick up the really basic documents that are on the table out there and you can read through them, please do that. And there was a notice of motion to send out uh, on Saturday. Um, Keith McLeod has a notice of motion. If you want to ask him about that, give him a buzz. Um, I'm sure he's happy to talk about what's behind his notice of motion. Um, that's tomorrow night here at 7.30. The other thing we're doing is we're inviting people who aren't members for whatever reason, then now's a sort of membership amnesty. Uh, come and speak to one of the elders or myself and in two weeks time we're going to have a membership commitment um, at our Sunday morning service. So um, yeah, speak to us about that. Next week here at 10.30 we'll have other people coming who've been meeting at nine o'clock uh, in the church across there. So th um, that's been a sort of combined service between South Folk and others. So they're coming here. Make sure you make them really welcome. Uh, we want uh, them to feel part of our gathering, our congregation, our family here. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. So keep your eye out for people that you don't know and start to learn some names. I look around every week and think, whose name don't I know? And um, yeah, get to know people. That'll be really nice. A nice welcoming environment next week. Um, and we are not taking up the offering week by week because, well, most people give actually online um, regularly. It's a great way to sort of regularly and self-sacrificially give. But there is a box up the back. Have a look at that. It's, it's the first time it's ever been there. Everyone turn around. On that sort of pillar there, look at that. Yeah, thank you, Camilla. I have uh, my attendant there. Um, and you can just drop your offering in that because there's no need to do that in a showy way. We just have that there and um, you can give that way if you need to give by cash. Uh, in less than a fortnight, one day short of a fortnight, we're having our go-go second-hand sale. So now really is the time to bring in some bits and pieces. If they're really huge, you can bring them in on the Friday night. Oh, sorry, it is next Saturday. What's in a fortnight? I'm now I'm sort of a bit out in my head. It is on Saturday, less than a week. Next week we're inviting people into this service. Fortnight was the membership yeah, commitment. There you go. It's too many things happening. Uh, so, yeah, Saturday is the go-go garage sale. And next week, as well as welcoming people into this service, we're going to have some missionaries with us who are going with MAF to PNG. Now, if you'd like to join them for lunch to really get to know them more personally and to hear their story a little bit more uh, in more detail than they can present in the service, can you uh, see myself? Um, Yep, that, well, I'm looking for someone else in the missions committee, but they're not here. So um, see me if you'd like to join that because we just got to sort out catering. But everyone would be most welcome to come to remain behind after the service to join um, some APWM missionaries who are going to PNG with MAF and they'd love to tell you their story over lunch. Yes. I think that's all. I wanted to have a, um, a bit of a Mother's Day reflection today. I'm, um, being, I'm part of a group of Christians in science, and a week and a half ago we heard from Professor Dennis Alexander, who's the Emeritus Director of the Faraday Institute of Science and Religion at Cambridge. Um, the wonderful thing about COVID is that uh, people are using Zoom technology much more proficiently, and we're able to hear international speakers just beamed into our... Um, our houses with relatively little expense. He gave a talk on epigenetics and the things that actually shape us as people. So epigenetics is a, um, a, core, uh, it's a field of science that has really uh, taken off in the last two decades. Um, there's been a real understanding that the DNA that we get, that we inherit from our mother and our father, that are contained in what is the human genome, is expressed variously, actually. And so the old debate of uh, who are we, are we... Um, um, who are we as people? Are we made by nature or nurture? We're recognising we can't hold that dichotomy anymore, that they're actually very much intertwined. It also comes hand in a glove with the understanding of neural plasticity. Have you heard of that? Like where the brain is not actually sort of a settled state, even you know, after the development of childhood and adolescence, but it's constantly changing. Um, even um, you know, as a 60, 70, 80, 90 year old. Um, and so, he reflected on Psalm 139, which I want to read out, 
And it says, you have created my inmost being. You've knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, of course, the psalmist has got no idea about genetics, about DNA, and about what actually makes us who we are. Um, but he does understand that we are sovereignly made um, by God. And so Dennis Alexander was reflecting on this and saying um, what we are coming to understand is that our environment actually begins to shape, go back in and it shapes the human genome in ways that we've never been able to understand before. We always thought that the DNA just expressed itself straight out and was unshaped by the environment. You're knit together in my mother's womb. He reflected on how, at, uh, at its worst, um, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome is where the environment works back in to the child that's being carried. Um, but that's a very drastic and traumatic environment, fetal alcohol syndrome. It can even just be the mood that the mother takes. Now, this is going to put young mums on edge. But, um, you know, if the mother's always angry or impatient and the hormones are always sort of flushing around the body, that actually works back in to even as deeply as the genome. Amazing. This is what they're discovering. And so it doesn't stop when the child comes out of the womb either. But the environment that we live in might be a household environment, might be a neighbourly environment, a community environment, a school environment. Um, but that environment actually shapes deeply within and impacts the human genome. It might be the church environment. And so given that, I was reflecting as well on, um, yeah, just that motherhood is not something just for mothers in a way. We're all, whether we have had children or not, we are all shaping the lives of others, particularly the very young and developing, but even the old. We are, as communities, we are shaping one another, like iron sharpens iron. And so I read this other article and I thought this is really good reflection for us on Mother's Day, and particularly for those who maybe might have wanted to be a mother or not a mother for whatever reason. This is the article, the little paragraph. There are a thousand ways to be a mother. I know women who mother with their every phone call, card or message to the child of someone they love. With every visit, every special trip to the cinema, every shoulder they offer to someone to cry on, every wise bit of hard-learned advice that they share. There are a thousand ways to mother, a thousand kinds of mother, and they don't all look like the ones in your Facebook feed. So to all the women who provide love and care and support for children, the aunts and the best friends and the neighbours and the kindergarten teachers and the co-workers and the carers, those with, without or around children, Mother's Day is a day for you too. Nice reflection, isn't it? I wonder if you can share with the person next to you, what are you thankful for about your mother? Just share with the person next to you. A couple of minutes. What are you thankful for about your mother? Well, it's nice to remember our mothers, whether or not they're still with us, to be thankful for them. And um, I'm going to lead us in prayer and uh, focus on motherhood. Um, giving God thanks for our mothers, praying for those who are mothers of young children especially, but um, praying for all of us as uh, we sort of mother one another. We show those caring attitudes. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we do thank you that you are the giver of life and uh, the life that we have is utterly dependent upon you. And uh, Father, we um, pray that the life that we live would exhibit thanks and praise to you for all things. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our mothers and for the way they have loved us in ways that we could never really know, uh, particularly in those very dependent years where um, yeah, even our very sustenance depended upon their kindness and their goodness to us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the way they gave us an environment that we could learn something about right and wrong and about relationships uh, for that environment of family. Uh, Father, we 
pray for those who are mothers and particularly of young children um, who are dependent upon them. Uh, Father, we pray that you would give them strength for what's an incredibly demanding role um, where children are hanging off them almost 24-7. Uh, Father, we pray that um, mothers might be able to find time to um, recuperate and to be sustained, that they might continue to love um, those that are dependent upon them. Father, we want to pray also for mothers of adult children and for grandmothers. And uh, though they might uh, not have uh, children at home with them, Father, we pray that they might still take a motherly care uh, uh, over their children and grandchildren, that that would exhibit itself in real prayerfulness, faithful prayerfulness uh, for their children and grandchildren. Um, and Lord, also exhibit it in wisdom. Father, we know that uh, the covenant of family is to be honoured and um, so we do pray uh, that grandmothers might know uh, when to speak and when to be silent and uh, yeah, that they would respect the parents of their grandchildren. Father, we do want to remember those who grieve because Mother's Day brings them sadness. Uh, maybe it's those who've lost children, the terrible grief of having to bury those that they've brought into the world. Lord, be with them and in their grief, uh, Father, help them to look to you um, uh, to find your comfort and in your uh, faithfulness and the promises of eternal life for those in Christ Jesus. I want to pray also for those who are separated from their children because of geographic distance. And Lord, we recognise that in this time of pandemic, uh, that can be particularly harsh uh, for those who have children who are overseas. Um, Father, we grieve with them and we know that this is a result of the fallen of a fallen world. We think too of those uh, of the state border uh, closures which have made travel difficult even within our country. Father, we pray for those who are distanced because of relational conflict and the heartache of not being able to be with children because uh, yeah, things have happened or so-called that they are now um, yes, uh, alienated for, cause of, for reason of conflict. Father, we pray that as Christian people we can extend grace and forbearance as much as we are able and to seek peace as much as it depends upon us. Uh, whilst also entrusting those um, that we love to you. Father, we recognise uh, the longing uh, to be a mum that you have planted within women, uh, many women, and we pray for those who have never been able to have children, either because of infertility or they haven't met the right person or they're not attracted to the opposite sex. And so, um, yeah, whilst they would have loved to have had children, that has not been possible. Uh, Father, help them to know that you will put all things right and that their identity doesn't depend upon being a mother. Uh, their identity as a woman and um, does not depend on having children. Father, we also want to pray for those who've lost mothers and who just feel that keenly. Um, yeah, we pray that uh, they too would know the hope of reunion for those that are in Christ and uh, otherwise that they would commit themselves to you. Uh, in trust that all things will end well. Father, we do want to thank you for the church community. Uh, we thank you for the way you bring us together as brothers and sisters in Christ, the way we call on the same Father. And we pray that we might practice family uh, with much more faithfulness to your word. Uh, help us, Lord, to be mindful of those who might be alone and help us uh, to be able to love others in a motherly kind of way. Um, yeah, just reflecting on the way you knit us together in our mother's womb, not just by genetics, but also by environment. We thank you for the environment that is church and help us to be loving towards one another, gracious and kind and um, supportive. Lord, help us to live as the people of God, we pray. Mm. Lord, continue to be with us now and even as we um, turn our attention to your word and uh, your justice, your kindness in Christ, uh, Father, we pray uh, that, that that might continue to shape us as your people as we live together in community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. All righty, we're going to sing as we come to the ministry of the word and we are singing, Show Us Christ. Cool. 
Take a seat and get out your Bibles if you bought one or your phone if you didn't. Um, and we're reading today from 2 Samuel chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 4. When Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost courage and all Israel became alarmed. Now Saul's son had two men who were leaders of raiding bands. One was named Barna and the other Rechab. They were sons of Rimon, the Beerothite, from the tribe of Benjamin. Beeroth is considered part of Benjamin because the people of Beeroth fled to Gitaim and lived there as aliens to this day. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. Sorry, I did practice this, I did, I promise you. Now, Rechab and Bana, the sons of Rimon, the Berathite, set out for the house of Ishbosheth, and they arrived there in the heat of the day while he was taking his noonday rest. They went into the inner part of the house as if to get some wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and his brother Barnar slipped away. They had gone into the house while he was lying on the bed in his bedroom. After they stabbed him and killed him, they cut off his head. Taking it with them, they travelled all the way, all night by the way of Ar Arabah. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to take your life. 
This day the Lord has avenged my Lord and the king against Saul and his offspring. David answered Rechab and his brother Bana, the sons of Rimmon the Berethite, As surely as the Lord lives who has delivered me out of all my trouble, when a man told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed? Should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? So David gave an order to his men and they killed him. They cut off their hands and feet and hung the bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. Oh my. If you were going to hand pick a passage out of the Bible for Mother's Day, 2 Samuel chapter 4 is not the passage that you would pick. Fair enough. The beheading of an innocent man as he slept on his bed and then the subsequent public execution by the government of two men who did it, complete with dismembering, by the way, on, and then uh, hanging their bodies in the civic square for punishment for their crime. Sounds like the warring tribes of Afghanistan and the harshness of Taliban rule, doesn't it, really? Lovely. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Why didn't I change it? I mean, I could have chosen a passage that, you know compared God's care of his children to like a, uh, the motherly care of a bird for her chicks. And, and that would have been nice. There have to be some very good reasons for ploughing on with our 2 Samuel series. And I think that there are. You see, I think there can be nothing more life-giving than the drip feed of God's word week by week as together we try to build a very deep understanding of who God is as he's revealed himself in the scriptures. God's word is life-giving. We just sang about it. I love that song as a prelude to the teaching of God's word. God's word shapes our thinking, transforms our living. And that's exactly what we need on Mother's Day, actually. I have a real commitment not to be embarrassed by any of God's word, including these really awkward passages in the Old Testament. I want to tell you a story to illustrate. I remember when I was one of the responsible adults on a year nine trek for King's College. I think it was the year just after Benny McLeod did it. And uh, the students, did you do a year nine trek? You did, yeah. There you go. It was the year after you did it, and I was there on that. And uh, the students were given devotions to kick the morning off. And uh, now you know year nines. They're just the worst year in secondary school, right? And, uh, and uh, w there was one lad who'd been given the responsibility of taking a devotion. He didn't come from a Christian family and he was a really kind of, you know, he was working out who he was as an independent individual and he didn't really respect authorities much. And so I thought I'd go to him and sort of hold out an olive branch and say, now listen, you don't, you don't need to use the Bible in your devotion because I know that you're not very familiar with it. He said, no, sir, I've got it under control. I said, oh, really? Do you want any help with that? No, I've got it under control. So the next morning, we're sitting down in mixed company, year nines, girls and boys, and he gets out the Bible, big smile on his face, and he reads through all the purity laws in, Vic in Leviticus about nocturnal emissions by men and menstruation by women, and he's really proud as punch about what he's doing. What do I do as a minister of God's word? Am I embarrassed by God's word, these parts in the Old Testament that seem irrelevant? Um, do I go, well, we can't hear that. That's, that's PG. God's word's not suitable for children, for youth. No, I try to be cool as a cucumber. And I just say, okay, now can you help us? Um, how is that going to encourage us today on our walk? <laughs> and he was struggling to say the least. But then I began to unpack it and say how God uses it as a metaphor for the fact that we're spiritually unclean before him and that Jesus shed his blood on the cross to cleanse us fully and finally and to restore us to right relationship with God. You see, what are we to do with these passages that speak of what seems like God-ordained violence in the Old Testament? It's an important thing. Are these passages an embarrassment for Christians in the modern world? Should we just sidestep them and move on as if we don't know how to deal with them? When the scriptures say that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for training in righteousness. On Mother's Day, is it appropriate to have 2 Samuel chapter 4? I think it is. It trains us um, to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So let's pray as we get into 2 Samuel chapter 4. Lord God, we are confident that your word speaks life. 
And we do want to hear it clearly. We want to patiently build a right understanding of who you are uh, so that we can uh, know the fullness of life that you intend for us and that we as Christians can live faithfully in the modern world, that we can confidently hold out the word of life and point to Christ Jesus, who is our Saviour, who brings your justice. Uh, Father, speak to us this morning, we pray. Amen. Well, we've been in 2 Samuel since Easter. And there has been a map that's been really helpful for us because King Saul has died in the north and over these first uh, four, three chapters, people have been lobbying for position in the new government of David. You'll remember the Amalekite um, who thought that he could gain favour with David by boasting about being the one who actually finished Saul off on the battlefield. But he came down to, uh, down to David in Hebron and told him how he'd finished off uh, Saul and he was judged for raising his hand against the Lord's anointed. And David was made king in Hebron, uh, which was just over the southern tribes of Judah. And he extended a, an olive branch, if you remember, to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Saul's men who were right down there near the border. And meanwhile, in the north, last week, we heard that Saul's commander Abner tries to strengthen his own position in a whole host of different ways. First of all, he takes Saul's son, Ishbosheth, makes him king um, over the northern tribes, and then he goes down and takes on David's men. You'll remember the 12 on 12 standoff, but it didn't help him at all. He was defeated in military defeat. And so he decided he'd take over Saul's concubine and pop populate the, the northern lineage, but that was to no avail. Ishbosheth got jealous. And so then he went down south. Um, and tried to uh, weasel his way into David's regime, but he put Joab offside and Joab killed him for his trouble. And by the time we get to 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 1, we're just shaking our head thinking, man, this is an absolute mess. These are the people of God and they're divided and they're warring and the, the throne's up for grabs. And that's where we find ourselves at chapter 4, verse 1, with the northern tribes breathing their last. It says, When Ish-bosheth, son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost courage. And literally it reads, his hands dropped. Oh, you could say he gave up the fight. And so the narrator records, all Israel became alarmed. And why wouldn't they become alarmed? Because for years, David down south had been appointed as the next king, but they were holding out hope that Saul would continue to reign in the northern territories. But Saul's killed and the hopes for northern independence is dwindling. Saul's commander Abner has been executed. And now Saul's son, Ishbosheth, has dropped his hands, his lost heart. The northern tribes are on the verge of their last breath. And they're beginning to wonder, when will David's henchmen come up from the south and take them? Well, we're introduced to new, two new characters in our story in verse 2. Saul's son, Ishbosheth, had two men who were leaders of raiding bands. One was named Barna and the other Rechab. We're meeting these new characters in the story and we're sort of wondering, are they going to be reinforcements for Ishbosheth? I mean, they're leaders of his raiding bands. Are they going to strengthen his courage and lift up his arms again? Uh, well, that's called into question a bit when we see where they're from in verse 2. They're sons of Rimon, the Berethite, from the tribe of Benjamin. Can you see Benjamin right down there in the south towards David's territory where the men of Jabesh Gilead have already gone across and, uh, and so we're thinking, oh, hang on, what are these men going to do? Are they going to strengthen Ishbosheth in the north? Are they going to slip down to David in the south? Is there any other hope for the north, maybe? Well, Saul has a grandson. Verse 4 Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. Doesn't look like Mephibosheth's going to be of any help. He's, all, he's lame and disabled. So what are Bana and Rachab going to do? Are they going to stand by their man in the north? Or being from Benjamin, is their loyalty going to drift to the south? Well, in verse 5, now Bana and Rechab, the sons of Rimon the Berethite, they set out for the house of Ishbosheth, and they arrived there in the heat of the day while he's taking his noonday rest. They went into the inner part of the house as if to get some wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and his brother slipped away. 
He'd gone into the house while he was lying on his bed in the bedroom. Uh, after they stabbed him, they killed him and cut off his head. Did you notice the way the story's told? Like in verse 7 there, it's a bit of a repeat of what he said in verse 5 and 6. And that, that was, sounds repetitive to our ear, but that was a way of telling Hebrew narrative. You kind of repeat a little bit for emphasis and added a little bit more detail. So the narr- narrator's kind of saying, you know, they, they, did you get that? They, they killed Ishbosheth in his sleep, they're saying. These leaders of the raiding bands, these men who are meant to be hard and tough and wiry warriors, They run their own master through the stomach and cut off his head while he's having a nana nap. You know, far from being bold and courageous, they're so cowardly that they enter his house flashing their security cards going, no danger here, we're the leaders of the raiding bands of our king, Ishbosheth. don't worry about us. They slip into the inner chamber and they kill him when his eyes are closed and he's unconscious to the world. The narrator's using... Sarcasm, such courage, so tough. He's exposed them. And now their traitor mindset gets exposed with their actions in verse 7. Taking his head with them, they travel all night by the way of the Arabah, and they brought the head of Ishbosheth down to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here's the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy who tried to kill you. This day the Lord has avenged my Lord the king against Saul and his offspring. What crawlers! <laughs> Just like the Amalekite in chapter 1, just like Abner in chapter 3, so Rechab and Abana are deceptively and treacherously trying to feather their nest in the regime of the newly appointed king. But in every instance, do you notice how these men try to do it? They use theology to hide their evil intent. They come sprouting allegiance to God's King David, but really they're ruled by their own selfish ambition. They come pretending to be servants to their new Lord, you know, pretending that they've been the one to execute justice against David's rivals, but really they're only looking to their own betterment. Ralph Dale Davis is a commentator I'm reading. He's the professor of a reformed theological seminary in Mississippi. And uh, he says, They come with theology on their lips, but blood on their hands. I love that phrase. They come with theology on their lips, but blood on their hands. And he says, It's very easy to create a theological position to serve your own selfish desire. So easy to do, isn't it? And often we've got no idea that we're even doing it. You know, we're impassioned about something. You know, we we feel like we've got to stand on some principle. We think it's a righteous stand. But Jeremiah 17, 9 speaks to us and says, the heart's deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? Ralph Davies goes on to say, sometimes theology is not the truth that leads us to worship, but it's a technique that allows us to excuse and justify ourselves. What does David make of this? You might think that he's relieved. That finally the north has had its last breath and it's blown out, if you like, with Ishbosheth's execution. I mean, all they've got left now is Mephibosheth and he's a lame man. He's not going to be king in the north. You might even think that David would parade Ishbosheth's head right down the main street. And you might think that's a bit gruesome. And of course, it would be in our day and age if any leader would actually do that, take someone's head and parade it down the street. But remember, back then, they didn't have any such thing as the news poll or the Morgan Gallup Poll that they could just publish in the newspapers, do you know what I mean, as to who's the most preferred Prime Minister. And so that's what the sort of thing that they used to do um, to show, hey, all my rivals are defeated, I alone will now rule. But he doesn't do that. He knows who has brought him to this place of kingship. It was not the Philistines who defeated Saul. It wasn't the Amalekite who, well, boasted of finishing him off. It's not Barna and Rechab who've run Ishbosheth through. In verse 9, David answered Rechab and his brother Barna, the sons of Rimon the Berethite, as surely as the Lord lives who has delivered me out of trouble. And that right there is the kernel of this passage. The Lord is sovereignly acting through all this mess of chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4. All the selfish ambition and the treachery of men and their violence, 
The Lord is acting to bring David to be his king. Now, we've got to, we might got to make sure we don't misunderstand this doctrine of God's sovereignty. You know, God doesn't condone the action. He's not the author of the action, all this evil and this violence in 2 Samuel chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4. I think our Westminster Confession is really helpful. and It says this, hang on to it because it balances sovereignty and responsibility very carefully. God has freely and unchangeably ordained whatever happens. This does not mean, however, that God is the author of sin. He is not. And nor that he represses the will of his created beings or takes away their freedom. Can you see what it's saying? God is sovereign over absolutely everything, even the wickedness and evil of men. But he is not the author of sin. It's wonderful, isn't it? David knows it is the Lord who's delivered him out of trouble and has delivered him to the throne, but the Lord has not been the author of the violence that has enabled that. He didn't need Barna and Rechab's bloodthirsty help. David has been established as king at the end of 2 Samuel 4. And so what does he do? Well, he establishes his justice. And there's a PG warning here. Okay, block the ears of the kids. It's not pretty. In verse 10, he says, When someone told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. Of course, he's talking about the Amalekite in chapter 1. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his bed, should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? And so David gave an order to his men and they killed them. They cut off their hands and feet and hung the bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. All right. To this point... David has mostly been acting with humility, with grace, with love and compassion, even for his enemies. But what's this? He has the assassins killed, dismembered and hung out in public. Now, he did do a similar thing to the Amalekite in chapter 1, you remember. And we wonder, why wasn't David rebuked for his heavy-handed approach to justice? Why don't the scriptures say, and what David did was excessive and wrong and shouldn't be modelled? Is this an embarrassing part of the scriptures that we want hidden from public view? Does the Bible condone this sort of justice or even worse, encourage violence? How are we meant to understand this? I want to help you in your apologetic for how you can actually engage with people who might be really critical of the Bible and say that it encourages violence. Firstly, David is acting as a head of state. See, this is not personal revenge. In fact, the truth is, David's order for the Amalekite to be slain and for Bana and Rechab to be executed is actually him standing in defence of his enemies, Saul and Ishbosheth, who were slain. David's standing for them and justice for them. It is a determination of justice. He's not killing out of personal ambition or, 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 or selfish ambition or personal anger. He is the king. And he's making a public declaration now that he is king that there will be justice in his kingdom. You can't live in my kingdom and get away with ruthless assassinations of innocent people on their bed, even if you're trying to curry favour with me. But even so, even if he is executing justice, that doesn't mean that, uh, that we can get away with bloodthirsty and gruesome justice in our day and age, does it? It's not encouraging uh, the law courts to hand down sentences in our society like execution or dismemberment or hanging in the city square, you know, like the Taliban might do in Afghanistan, as if that's an appropriate sentence uh, for the murder of the innocent. No, of course we're not expecting that. And that's why it's really important to read things in historical context. We can't expect King David, a thousand years before Christ, to uphold justice as we do in the modern day. It was an ancient day. 
Remember, just, just a couple of generations before, it was the end of Judges, and there was a loose federation of warring tribes, and, one, and there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Remember that? That's the statement at the end of judge, just, Judges. And the period of Judges wound up with some of the worst atrocities recorded in the Bible in those last chapters of, ju of Judges. That was only 50 to 100 years earlier. And so now David has come as king, and he's bringing justice in this nation. But he doesn't have the established law courts that we do. There's not an education system across the population. There's not law enforcement and a penal system that we have today. And so if we read 2 Samuel 4 and conclude that the Bible encourages violence, then we're being grossly unfair and historically naive. We're meant to read 2 Samuel 4 and conclude that the Bible upholds justice. That's what it's teaching us. Now, there's one more step to take. We've got to wind the clock on 1,000 years from David, King David, to the king who upheld justice in an ultimate and final way. Because at the appointed time, when God had decided that enough was enough, when he wanted to execute his justice upon all the waywardness and the sinfulness and the violence of humankind, he sent his son into the world. Jesus is the righteousness of God. He was without sin. And when he came to implement his final act of justice, he didn't pull out his sword, cut off anyone's head and dismember them and hang them in the public square. In fact, when, his, when people came for him with their swords, he told his disciples, put away your swords. Because he had come to take the sword for us. He went to the cross and there he was executed for us. And that is how God upholds his final justice, so that he can forgive. He who knew no sin became sin for us. By his wounds we are healed. So next time, um, when someone challenges you and says religions promote violence, how are you going to answer? I think, first of all, we need to answer with utmost humility and recognise that there have been times in Christendom when Christians have perpetrated violence or when people who carry the name of Christ have perpetrated violence. But then I think we need to move on and say, no, but Jesus commanded non-violence. That's the first thing. If we actually go back and listen to what the Lord Jesus said, he told his disciples to put away their sword. He told his disciples to turn the other cheek. He told his disciples to love their enemies and to pray for those who persecute them. That's the first thing. And then when he, as king and lord, came to execute justice, his way of doing that was to be executed for us, to take the sting out of death by satisfying the law for us. That was revolutionary in the way kings have brought justice. And lastly, and I think that this is something that we really need to hang on to in this day and age when our Western civil liberties are being demolished. That is that the Christian gospel is actually the worldview that teaches three fundamental truths that have enabled democracy to flourish. Because democracy is a great protection against violence. I'm not saying it's a perfect protection, but it's a great protection against violence. The fact is, democracy doesn't sit happily with many other worldviews. So of the 57 member states of the, uh, of the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation, only six of those are democratic, and all six of those are substantially flawed. Why is it that Christianity encourages the flourishing of democracy? Three truths. One, the equal value of every human being because we're made in the image of God. Two, the depravity of humanity means that power needs to be dispersed. It cannot stand within the hands of one or a few people. And three is servant leadership, that leaders are in positions of power to serve their people. And so they are actually accountable to their people. And it's the people who decides whether or not they're doing a good job and the people can get rid of them in an orderly fashion. We think... That democracy is just a natural thing and we presume that it's going to spring up everywhere in society. It's not the case. They are, it arises because of three fundamental truths embedded in the Christian scriptures. So next time someone tells you that war and violence is a religious problem, 
I think we concede that historically, sometimes under the name of Christ, um, Christian nations and people have committed all sorts of awful atrocities, but that's not what Christ himself teaches. That's how people have distorted the Christian faith. But then to recognise war and violence is not a religious problem at all. It's a human problem. There have been acts of aggression by Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist and Jewish nations. And the most severe atrocities committed have actually been conducted under atheist regimes. Like communist nations of the Soviet Union and China under Stalin and Mao. And fascist nations like Hitler's Germany. Religion didn't have a place in that. Violence and war is a human problem. So thank God for Jesus, the model human who has established justice. It was costly. The Son of God was slain for us. And so we who have faith in him, we wait patiently until he ushers in his final kingdom. You know, a kingdom that will come with justice and peace and joy. And whilst we look out at the world and all the injustices and the violence and the atrocities in this world, we don't despair or lose hope. God has a solution for that problem. It's in the Lord Jesus, in his reign and in the coming of his kingdom. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, there are some passages in the Bible that are very difficult to read. But we thank you that your all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting and training in righteousness. We thank you for 2 Samuel 4 and the fact that it teaches us uh, that justice is to be treasured. It is a good for all people. But Lord, we humbly confess that when it comes to your unbending and just rule, we're on the wrong end of the stick. We confess our own sinfulness and uh, what we deserve is your judgment. But thank you that you are also a gracious and kind God and that our Lord Jesus who has come uh, to be Lord and judge is also uh, King and Saviour. Uh, Father, we thank you that we as your people can model something of your just rule. Uh, living, uh, not blown here and there by every wind of teaching, but knowing your will and your ways, your truth and your righteousness, your holiness and your justice but offering your compassion and your mercy in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven or if we live in the kingdoms of this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to continue praying as we sing. So do sing this song prayerfully. It's based on the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's our church arise. That's a, that's a rally call. It's not a prayer. It's a rally call to one another. Let's do that.
Please stay behind for some Mother's Day morning tea. And um, Kaz has got some little parcels for every woman, I think, in our congregation. I want to finish with Paul's words, the Ephesians. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to all who love our Lord Jesus with an undying love. Let's go in peace. Amen.